All right, Haley, I see a, a pause in the folks coming in, so I'm going to go ahead and get us started. Um, welcome, everyone, to our monthly Lunch and Learn session. Hopefully, some of y'all have returned and you've been with us in the past months, and we greatly appreciate it. If this is your first Lunch and Learn with us, um, thank you so much, and we're glad you picked this topic. It's such an important one. Uh, and we do do this monthly, so you'll get more information about our upcoming seminars uh, in those topics uh, as we go along. So we hope to see you in the months ahead. Um, just a few quick housekeep housekeeping tips. Um, first, let me introduce myself. I'm Alex Huffman. I'm the Assistant Director of Support Services at the Cancer Center. Um, this is a recorded session. You will get a link to the recording sent early next week. Um, so you can definitely reference anything that you've seen here. If you have to hop in and out, uh, you'll have the full content available to you. Um, we hope you will put your questions in the chat. And just a note that we try to be as informative and responsive to those questions as we can. However, we're not able to give a specific guidance on maybe a direct question that might be unique to you. So if you have some of those, we would be happy to get you connected uh, to the social workers in your clinic if you're treated here or to some more information um, on your question. So now I'm going to turn it over to Haley Wilshire, who is our uh, lovely, lovely clinical social worker out at the Simmons Cancer Center Clinic at Fort Worth. Haley is an oncology certified social worker who's been doing this for eight years in the outpatient cancer setting. Haley is absolutely passionate about providing education and support to those with cancer and near the end of life. So thank you so much, Haley. I'm going to turn it over to you uh, to get into this great topic today. Great. Thank you so much, Alex. Let me go ahead and share my screen. Okay. Thank you, everyone, again, for joining us. Um, today, we're talking about empowering choices, um, really talking about navigating advanced care planning, and then we'll touch on National Healthcare Decisions Day at the end. So our objectives today are to learn about the basics of advanced care planning, what it is, why it's important, and who should complete advanced care planning. We will then discuss the three main healthcare um, directives that we often discuss with our patients at the Cancer Center. And then we will review some helpful resources. Um, and lastly, we will share about National Healthcare Decisions Day. So to get started, what is advanced care planning? Advanced care planning is really a process and it's conversations. It's not just about completing documents and directives, it's a process. And I'm gonna really emphasize this throughout this whole presentation. So the process of advanced care planning can really help you understand healthcare treatment options. It may be able to help you clarify some of your health goals. It can allow you to weigh options on the care that you do and do not want. And it gives you the option to make decisions and communicate those decisions in writing with your family, friends, and healthcare providers. Again, advanced care planning is not just about completing documents. It is first and foremost a discussion between yourself, your family, and your friends, and those that provide your medical care. Advanced care planning is a means of discussing your values and desires with your medical team to determine what living well means to you. You can then create a care plan that reflects those preferences. Completing advanced directives can help ensure that your preferences are upheld and provide direction and confirmation to your loved ones enacting decisions on your behalf. So what are some of the advantages to advanced care planning? Number one, it allows you to express your values and desires. This allows everyone to be on the same page and for everyone to know what you do and do not want. Two, it can offer peace of mind to both you and your loved ones. People don't know what they don't know. It is very difficult to be in charge of someone's medical decisions, especially if you have not had conversations or at least written something on paper about your values and desires. By thinking through your options and communicating these wishes to your loved ones, there's a better chance your true desires will be up upheld. And three, it's an ongoing process. Your medical directives can be adjusted at any time. 
Maybe you have new information, maybe you've had a change in your health, or maybe you've simply just changed your mind. You can always make changes as needed. This is a quote from the CDC in regards to advanced care planning. In a nutshell, we do advanced care planning to reduce unnecessary suffering, improve quality of life, and help people understand the decisions that may need to be made. A key concept here is quality of life. Quality of life is subjective and very individualized. So your idea of a good quality of life is almost certainly going to differ in some ways from how others watching this Lunch and Learn would perceive as a good quality of life. And that's okay. There's no right or wrong. It really is about what is right for you. So who should be doing advanced care planning? Everyone. At any time, you could become too ill to be able to make your own medical decisions. This is not just a process for people of older age or with a terminal illness. This is really for everyone. So if you have a moment, I'd like to kind of hear from you in, in the chat box. Um, have you completed any advanced directives or have you had any at least some conversations about your end of life preferences? You can say yes or yes, I've completed a few. Give you a minute to look. Someone said yes, yes, great. Love that. Yes, but not fully. And that's awesome. So that means that we're going to continue to have these conversations. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Let me, if it'll let me go to the next page. This is a brief video that I really like because it really talks about the importance of advanced care planning and how sometimes these conversations are pretty difficult to have, um, but really shows the importance of that. My name is Diana and Boy and I are husband and wife. My name is Anita and John is my dad. My name's John, uh, I'm Quibby's husband. So Roy gets to go on a trip of a lifetime. Where does he want to go? <laughs> um, I'd say Bora Bora. <laughs> well, I definitely want to go with Bora Bora. What food could Anita not live without? Probably um, curry. Anything Asian. <laughs> he couldn't live without a lot of food. And what about you? What food could you not live without? Probably fruit in general. Probably chocolate. <laughs> <Just> ch <laughs> what? Anita asking me, so what's this about? <laughs> So I don't know. If you can think about a moment where you pushed through a hard time together, can you describe that? At school, when she was being bullied, we had to see some counselling. Just talking me through it and helping me get through it. Kind words and lots of hugs. <laughs> For me, it was probably the time when we were first trying to have a, our, our first child, I guess. Uh, we went through IVF and, and things like that. Becoming parents is something that we all hoped would come naturally, but it didn't to us initially, and we worked through that together. Roy's hurt in a car accident. He needs a breathing tube for the rest of his life, and he'll never speak again. Would you consent to this? Well, yeah, I would, yeah. No, I wouldn't. Definitely not. I don't think I would want to put burden anyone with that. So I'd rather not. <laughs> yeah. Anita had three months to live. Treatment would give her an extra two months, but she would never see outside of a hospital. Would you consent to treatment? Yes. This was a difficult one, this one. Two months, you know, it's just one week, two months, any, any time. Not at all. <laughs> no. That's unexpected. I don't, I don't want to be kept in a hospital 
for forever. John has, has had a massive stroke. Does he want a feeding tube to keep him alive even though he'll never talk again? No. N no, I don't. Um, it's very important to me to be happy and functional in my life. No, I wouldn't want that to happen. Roy's in the last stages of terminal cancer and his heart stopped. Does he want CPR? Probably not. I don't think you would, no, I don't know. So how do you both feel after um, answering those questions and why? I felt quite, it felt quite um, confronting in a way. Um, but... You think about it and you talk about it just very lightheartedly, but I don't think anyone really mm. puts a lot of thought and, and serious thought into it. No. Why do you think that some couples don't talk about this? It's not a pleasant subject. I mean, nobody wants to, to dwell on the fact that they're going to die one day and possibly in adverse or difficult circumstances. So if I was to tell you that advanced care planning is essentially a conversation that helps your loved ones know what medical treatment to choose for you if you had a sudden event, what would you think about it now? I think it's a great idea. Yeah, absolutely. It's important, not just for yourself, but more so for your family, I think. Definitely have to have a bit more of a talk. And it's not just about the two of us. It, we For also kids, have kids, kids and all that kind yeah. of stuff, yeah. So there is a bit we need to consider. consider, yeah, 100%. Mm. So, why do people not have these conversations? You know, 90% of people say that it's important to talk about their preferences of end of life care, but only 27% of people have actually had these conversations. Why are people not having these conversations? It can be scary or hard. Sometimes people worry about maybe speaking something into existence. It's very normal to talk to your doctor about a plan for treatment, so I recommend considering advanced care planning as an extension of those kinds of discussions. This graphic shows different reasons why people have difficulties with this conversation. One says, talking about death scares me, so I avoid it. Another one says, I don't want to stress my wife out further about my illness. And another one says, I assume she would want to die at home, but I'm afraid to ask her. Social workers like myself often work with patients to process why they're hesitant to have these conversations, and we try to make this process a little less scary. So thinking about where to start these conversations can often be the most difficult part of this process. Some questions that you might want to start asking yourself include, who supports you during difficult times? What matters to me most through the end of my life? And where do I feel comfortable having these conversations? The Conversation Project says it always seems too soon until it's too late. So a good question to ask is when will you start this conversation? And when thinking about starting this conversation with friends or loved ones, some helpful phrases can include, can I have a conversation about blank? Or even though I'm okay right now, I'm worried that something might happen and I wanna be prepared. Can we talk about some things that matter to me? Or even just start with the basics of, I need your help with something. Mom. Mom. Dad. 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 Sweetie, can we talk? Everyone, you know, dies. <laughs> so, how do you want to go? <sighs> do you have a plan for your end of life care? Because I don't. Don't take this the wrong way, but you're not getting any younger. So I was binge watching Game of Thrones, which reminded me that everybody dies. Oh. 
You've heard of a birth plan, right? It's like that. Only the opposite. <sighs> I need your help with something. Can we talk? My biggest fear is losing you, and that I won't know how you want me to care for you toward the end. Remember what happened to Aunt Maria? I don't want that to happen to you. You've taken care of me your whole life. Now it's my turn to take care of you. So the important part is that you start having those conversations. It can be very difficult as that video just showed, but just taking that first step is the best place to start. So now that we've reviewed some of the basics of advanced care planning, let's talk about some myths or facts. We, um, this, we have touched on a few of these, so this may be a bit of a, re of a review. So myth or fact, my loved ones will know what I want when the time comes. That is a, Myth. In fact, your family may not know what you want. When asked to predict what end of life decisions their loved ones would make, only one or one in three guessed wrong. So that is why it is so important to start and continuing having these conversations. Myth or fact. I need a lawyer to create an advanced care plan. That is a myth. The fact is most states have free advanced directive forms online and social workers can also assist you as well. You do not need a lawyer. Myth or fact, everyone should create an advanced care plan. That is a fact. Again, it's impossible to predict the future. An emergency can happen at any age. So creating a plan now can help ensure that someone you trust can make decisions that reflect your wishes. Myth or fact, advanced care planning only matters if I put it in writing. That is a myth. The most important part of planning is discussing your wishes with your loved ones. It can save them from worrying about whether they made the right decisions for you. Myth or fact, you can always change your ad advanced directives. That is a fact. Your advanced directives can be changed at any time. And we also suggest that you review your plans at least once a year, and especially after any major life event, such as a move, a divorce, or a change in your health. So now that we've talked about the process of advanced care planning, this leads us to discussing advanced healthcare directives. And advanced healthcare directives are actual legal documents that you can complete that help you communicate your wishes. The directives we will discuss today are the Medical Power of Attorney, or MPOA, the Living Will, which is also sometimes called the Directive to Physician, or even just sometimes called the Advanced Directive, and then lastly, we will talk about the out-of-hospital DNR. Now, some people will complete all of these documents, some will complete none, and some will complete a few of these. Everyone is different and will decide how to document their wishes in ways that make the most sense for them. Before we start with the medical power of attorney, it's important to talk about capacity. So capacity describes a person's ability to make a decision. In medical context, capacity refers to the ability to utilize information about an illness and proposed treatment options to make a choice that aligns with one's values and preferences. Capacity is defined around a specific medical decision. So individuals may have capacity in one clinical context, but maybe not in another. What does that really mean? It really means, are you able to make your own medical decisions? A doctor is the only one who can determine a patient's capacity to make their own medical decisions. In order to complete really any advanced directive, patients will need to have capacity to make their own medical decisions. So medical power of attorney, what does this form do? This form allows you to name someone who will make healthcare decisions for you if you are unable to do so. 
I really want to emphasize your medical power of attorney can only make these decisions for you if you are unable to do so yourself. This form also allows you to name two alternate agents. So if your designated medical power of attorney is unavailable or even if they're unwilling, they will contact your first alternate. If your first alternate is unavailable or unwilling, they will contact your second alternate. This forum does not allow for all three to have decision-making power at the same time. Your medical power of attorney only designates someone for your medical decisions, so no decisions regarding finances or estate. We will briefly touch on options for estate and finances a bit later in this presentation. The agent cannot be someone that's involved in your medical care unless they are your family member. And if you don't complete a medical power of attorney, your doctor will turn to your closest living relative as determined by state guidelines. But let's say sometimes your closest living relative may not be the one that knows the most about your wishes or desires or your medical information. Your friends and partners may be the ones who know you and your wishes best, not your blood relatives. In that situation, that is especially important to complete this form. So what makes an appropriate decision maker? This is someone who is a family member or a friend. They must be over the age of 18. They need to be someone that you trust will be there for you when you need them and will follow your wishes. They also need to be an advocate for you. Someone who is not afraid to speak up and ask questions when necessary and someone who knows your medical information. This is a a great video of someone kind of going through a list of people of who might be your med her medical power of attorney. Be your healthcare proxy. Like if you need someone to tell the doctor what to, I just go with whatever the doctors say. I wouldn't want to bother them. They're so busy. Doctors know best, right? <sighs> Healthcare proxy? Sure, I'd be happy to. If I'm in town, check out my Instagram pics from Peru. Wish you were here. Oh, I could never let you go. I can't even throw a plant away. As long as it's got one little green leaf. I'd be like, can't we upload her to the cloud? Well, heck yeah. I've given this a lot of thought. Let me tell you what decisions you're best off going with. You never let them resuscitate. And if they even try to hook you up to one of those breathing machines, never. I got this. I totally got this. How can you even talk about this? I can't, okay? I just can't. Mom, it's not like you're gonna die. No, I can't talk right now. Oh wait, did I show you that meme from iFunny? The cat and the dishwasher? Oh my gosh, okay. So the cat, the cat's like, Bleh. And then he's like, then he's like, what? <laughs> just... Oh wait, sorry, what? Well, hon, you and I have been through so much together. Here's what we'll do. We'll sit down, we'll get a cup of coffee, and you tell me what matters to you. Well, it wouldn't be easy. I mean, I'd be sad, but I'd have your back. I remember when we went through this with mom, we really spoke for her. So I think I can do that for you. Let's talk about what you would want. So what decisions can a medical power of attorney make? They make all decisions involving your health, including anything about medical treatment, such as your providers, surgery, CPR, ventilator, etc. They can also make end of life decisions, such as calling for a religious leader or helping decide where you will die. Remember that your medical power of attorney agent is an advocate for you. In order to make this form legally valid, you must sign in front of either two witnesses or a notary. You don't have to use both. The witnesses must be an adult. They can't be related to you or, and they can also not, they can also not be involved in your medical care. Um, and lastly, they also cannot benefit from your death. 
with the notary, that may be someone that happens to be a notary at UT Southwestern. I'm, I am a notary, so I often help my patients fully complete this form. Or you can use a non-UT Southwestern notary that are available at banks, post offices, or UPS stores. Now let's walk through how to complete this form. You start at the top where it says I, and then you would write your name here. Below that, it asks for name, address, and phone. That's where you would put the information of the person that you are appointing as your medical power of attorney. You put their name, their address, and their phone number right here. The next section goes over limitations. So sometimes there may be a specific decision that you don't want a person to make, and you can specify this information here. The next, it talks about designating an alternate agent, just as I mentioned before. So you have a first alternate agent here where you would write their name, address, and phone number. If you have a second alternate agent, you can put that here. You don't have to have first or second alternates. It's just always a good idea. The next part of the form says the original of the document is kept at. I typically tell my patients to write their home address. And if they have a specific location in their home where they keep copies of important documents, I would specify that right here as well. Next, it says the following, institu following individuals or institutions have signed copies. This is where you can write UT Southwestern and put our address, or you can put your primary care, or even you can put maybe your medical power of attorney in their address here as well. On the second page, this is an option to select a duration. So that means that there would be an end date on this document. Sometimes people complete this document prior to a surgery, and they want it to end after the surgery. I will say, I recommend keeping this section blank or kind of writing an X or NA right here, because as I mentioned earlier, you can always make changes to your medical power of attorney. And we also never know when we might become too ill to make our own decisions. And so we, it's always good to have the medical power of attorney valid and legal. The next part, it goes over a disclosure statement, which is really talking about a lot of the things that we discussed um, earlier in this presentation. On the next two pages, again, continues with the disclosure statement. I always recommend patients fully read through all of these documents prior to signing. If you want to sign in front of um, a notary, you would sign here, city, state, name, and then the notary would sign here. If you're signing in front of two witnesses, you would sign here, and your witnesses would sign here. Now on to the advanced directive, or sometimes called the living will, or even I think in Texas it's called the directive to physicians. Um, this document provides specific instructions to physicians about the types of treatment that you do or do not want. The document then gives you two hypothetical situations where you have either a terminal condition or an irreversible condition, and you must choose between either A, ending all treatment and pursuing comfort care, or B, being kept alive in a terminal or irreversible condition using all life-sustaining treatment options. This document really helps to clarify what is important to you in regards to quality of life and what living well means to you. The living well only goes into effect if you are unable to make decisions on your own behalf. If you are able to make decisions, your medical providers will ask you what you prefer directly. You may have a medical power of attorney and that is great. This living will can guide or reassure your decision-making agent that they are following your wishes. I often tell patients to think of this as kind of a reference. In order to make this form legally valid, it is the exact same process as the medical power of attorney. You can use either two witnesses or notary. Again, you only need one or the other, not both. So how do we complete this form? As you can see, it says directed to physicians, family, or surrogates. This is really important information about the document. Again, I highly recommend reading through all of this paperwork prior to signing. Now, if we look under directive, it says I. This is where you would write your name, 
And then it says recognize in recognize that the best health care is based upon a partnership of trust and communication with my physician. My physician and I will make health care or treatment decisions together as long as I am of sound mind and able to make my wishes known. If there comes a time that I'm unable to make decisions about myself because of an injury or illness, I direct the following treatment preferences be upheld. And this is where it talks about the, if you're suffering with a terminal condition or if you're suffering with an irreversible condition. And it gives you the two options where you request either all treatments other than those needed to keep me comfortable, be discontinued or withheld, and my physician allow me to die as gently as possible, or you request to be kept alive in this terminal condition using av all available life sustaining treatment. Now, some people will have the same answer on both of these. Some people will have different answers and that is completely fine. It is really about what is best for you and what your preferences are. On this next page, it talks about additional requests. So there may be a particular medical treatment that you know that you do or do not want. This is where you would want to specify that here. Often my patients will leave this section blank because they continue to have ongoing conversations about medical treatments and things that they do or do not want. But if there's something that you are especially particular about in regards to treatment, then you can put that here. If you do not have a medical power of attorney, you can put that here. I do suggest having a separate document for that. And then this is where you would sign date and put your city and county of residence. If you are in, if you're signing in front of two witnesses, if you are signing in front of a notary, you would sign here and then the notary would sign here as well. Now the out of hospital do not resuscitate order. This document allows you to decide that you do not want to be resuscitated should your heart stop beating or your lungs stop breathing. The DNR is definitely not required of everyone. However, if you do not want to be resuscitated, you must complete the DNR orders. Without physical paper copies of this order, medical providers are legally required to make every effort to restore your breathing and the normal rhythm of your heart. This form is only for when you are out of the hospital. So if you are in the hospital and do not want to be resuscitated, you must complete an order in the hospital. Some important things to note. Again, not everyone will complete a DNR. You must have a physical copy of the form in order for it to be followed. So a photo of the form is not going to be sufficient. Because of this, we suggest keeping copies in your purse, wallet, or clearly marked spots in your home. Some common locations can include an envelope on the fridge, hung inside the front door, or on the door to your bedroom. Some people think about maybe getting a DNR bracelet, and Texas Health and Human Services has a, man a list of manufacturers who make these DNR bracelets. These are a great option to have on you, but I do suggest if you have a bracelet to also try to have a copy of the form close by. How do we make the out of hospital DNR legal? Just like the other two directives, you can sign in front of either two witnesses or notary. Now this form is different in that you must have a physician sign as well. This is to ensure that you have capacity and that you really understand the significance of signing this order. Another note about this form is that everyone must sign the form twice. And if any signature is missing, this form will not be valid. Now let's briefly review how to complete this form. For the sake of today's presentation, let's assume that you have capacity to make your own decisions. To start, you will write your first, your, your full legal name here, date of birth, and then you will check male or female. Then we will skip to section A. And that's where you would sign, date, and print your name. Now let's skip all the way down to where it says two witnesses. This is where if you're using two witnesses, they would sign, date, and print their name. If you're using a notary, this is where they would put their notary information. Below that is the physician statement. This is where your physician will sign, date, 
print their name and also put their license number. As I mentioned, this form requires everyone to sign twice. So if we go all the way down where it says all persons who have signed above must sign below is where everyone will sign again. You would sign here, your physician would sign here, your witnesses, and then if you're using a notary, that would go there as well. This second page is really instructions to help you complete this form, especially if you um, are maybe trying to sign this on behalf of your of someone you are a medical power of attorney for. It gives you a lot of different situations. Um, okay. A few other documents that are often discussed in advanced care planning really include the written disposition of remains. So this form allows you to name someone who will be in charge of how your body is handled after death. So they decide about cremation, cemetery and funeral information. In Texas, the default person who would be in charge of your body is your surviving spouse. If you do not have a surviving spouse, but you have surviving children, then it would be them and so on. But Let's say that you have a longtime partner, but the two of you aren't married. This document helps you name your partner as a person who manages things if you die. We are able to provide information and a copy of this form if you are interested. Next is the Willed Body Program. Many patients have questions about donating their body to science after they die. UT Southwestern has a program that allows you to donate your body for research, and that program is called the Willed Body Program. And you can find more information about this program on that website. Lastly, we have the durable power of attorney and wills and trust. These really have a lot more to do with finances and property. Social workers, unfortunately, are typically unable to assist in the completion of these documents. However, we can provide you with resources that might be helpful. So speaking of resources, let's review some that we have found to be helpful. Starting that conversation is often the hardest part of this process. The Conversation Project has wonderful resources, including workbooks that can help start and guide the conversation. The Thinking Ahead Workbook is also a great start and is provided by the Texas Health and Human Services. To find copies of directives for the state of Texas, you can go to the Texas Health and Human Services website and download those. If you are interested in the DNR bracelet, this is the link for those. If you happen to live in another state and want information about directives in that state, or if they would maybe accept Texas directives, you can reach out to your social worker if you have one. Lastly, although social workers do not assist with wills or trust, these are low cost resources available, and that includes trustandwill.com and freewill.com. So now that you have all this information about advanced care planning and advanced healthcare directives, you may be asking yourself, well, what do I do now? I highly recommend starting with downloading a conversation guide. You can use these links, use these to think through your desires and end of life, and you can use these to have conversations with your friends, family, and medical providers. Next, I would encourage you to reach out to your medical providers. You may have specific questions regarding how treatments and end of life would affect you. Um, don't be afraid to ask questions and have these conversations with your medical providers. Additionally, if you have any additional questions I would and or would like assistance with maybe completing these, I suggest reaching out to your social worker for assistance. And lastly, I highly encourage you to attend National Healthcare Decisions Day. And you may be thinking, well, what is that? And I'm glad you asked. National Healthcare Decisions Day was founded in 2008 by Nathan Kotkamp. He was a Virginia-based healthcare lawyer. Mr. Kotkamp founded this day to provide clear, concise, and consistent information on healthcare decision making to both public and providers through the widespread availability and dissemination of simple, free, and uniform tools to guide the process. 
National Healthcare Decisions Day is an annual initiative which purpose is to encourage people to begin or continue conversations about their wishes for care through the end of life and to educate people on the importance of advanced care planning. It encourages individuals to express their wishes regarding health care and for providers and facilities to respect those wishes, whatever they may be. So how are we celebrating National Healthcare Decisions Day at Simmons Cancer Center? As part of Patient Experience Week on April 16th, so this upcoming Tuesday, we will have support services team booths at all of our sites, including the Cancer Center Outpatient Building in Dallas, our Richardson, Redbird, and Fort Worth locations, as well as the Radiation Oncology Clinic. Patients, families, and staff will be able to visit the booths to get information about advanced care planning and directives. Patients are going to be encouraged to take the information home and potentially complete advanced directives. We hope that we are able to provide as much information to as many people as possible. So if you are going to be at the Cancer Center on Tuesday, or if you are interested and just want to come and pick up information and ask questions, please come to one of our sites and a social worker or a chaplain will be happy to provide information and answer any questions that you may have. Again, this is next Tuesday from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. Um, at all of the Cancer Center sites. That brings us to the end of our discussion today, and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have now, or you can also email me at the address listed below. Awesome. Thanks so much, Haley. We do have one question. I'm sure we'll get a couple more. Um, the first question is, when you say full legal name, do you mean what's on your driver's license? So in this individual's case, a maiden name may be on the driver's license. Sure. I always recommend whatever is on your legal documents to put that on this document. Um, so if your maiden name happens to be on your license, that's the name that I would suggest. Perfect. Um, here's a question that says, can social workers consent as being a witness on a patient's advanced directive if they are not a notary? Yes. So our social workers in most of our cancer center sites are not notaries and often provide um, a witness signature because we're not directly involved in their medical care. Um, so they can act as a witness on those advanced directives. Perfect. And uh, we have a question about when the recording will be ready. It'll come out uh, early next week and those will be emailed to the email address you used when registering and you are welcome to share it. Um, this question is, can we attach the MPOA living will and the DNR forms with the link? I will uh, inquire with our amazing marketing and uh, and um, uh, Zoom help uh, on that. So we'll see. Here's a great question. And um, Haley, this comes up quite a bit because it's in some of our documentation here. What is a mental health directive? So a mental health directive really puts... Um, is a question about how, what types of men mental health treatment you want to have if it's determined that you're not able to make those decisions. Um, because as an oncology social worker, I don't typically work in the mental health sphere. We often leave that to kind of completing that with your primary care physician, or even maybe you have a psychologist or a psychiatrist that you see. Highly encourage talking with those medical providers about that documentation as well. 
yeah, it's a very specific document that is not often completed. Um, so we would refer you right back to uh, any mental health providers if you feel like that's necessary. I will say it is not in our top recommended directives um, unless there is a unique need there. Um, let's see, I'm scanning our questions. Um, are you able to provide copies of the documents at the hospital? Yeah, so oftentimes so, our chaplains are the ones that provide that information at the hospital. Um, mm -hmm. Often they're talking about it right before surgery as well. So encouraging you to talk with any of your providers that you see in the hospital to, to complete those there. Absolutely. And these are state forms. So they are also something that you can quickly search and find the, uh, the uh, absolute specific Texas forms online. Uh, what is the difference between a DNR, a do not resuscitate order, and an out of hospital DNR? Yeah, so kind of as it states, so the out of hospital DNR is really only effective if it's if you're out of the hospital. So maybe you're in your home and EMS is called and they won't um, try to resuscitate you there. Um, but if you're in the hospital, there's a, a specific form that you would have to fill out there. Um, so it'd be a little bit a little bit different form. Yeah. Um, forms, uh, the question about forms being uploaded to my chart. So could you talk a little bit about our process uh, in terms of completing these forms and where they go? And then one patient asked if they are accessible from the patient side of my chart. Yeah. So if you're interested in wanting to complete these forms, oftentimes you're probably asked when you're checked in, hey, do you have a copy of your medical power of attorney or living will? That's a great time to be able to provide that documentation to the front office staff. And what they do is they scan that in and make sure that it's in your chart. And then it, there's a checkbox in your chart that says, yes, they've completed these documents. If you have them and you aren't going to be here anytime soon, you can upload them to my chart and just tell, I would send that to your provider and say, hey, I'm interested in making sure that this is in my chart. Can you make sure that this is entered into the right situation? When I visit with patients and do this as well, I, I keep copies of those and I scan those into their chart as well. Perfect. And this question is um, related to that, that we ask, to your point, uh, if a patient has these documents every time. It's part of our, um, our check-in process. And so the check-in desk may not see if you have those upload, uploaded, so it feels repetitive. They just can't always see it on their side of things, depending on how they were uploaded. Um, here's a great question about reviewing old documents. If you've completed these in the past and you want to look at them now, years have gone by, months have gone by, things have changed, um, who do you recommend patients review those with? I think it's a good place to start with your social worker. Um, we may not be able to know at all of the forms that you have, but we can kind of look through those together, make sure that everything is up to date, and then give you um, some options to going forward. So maybe it's some forms that we can't help you with, but say maybe we can get you connected to another attorney. Um, I think that's always a good place to start. Absolutely. And I think um, the forms that we covered today, the um, advanced directives, the MPOA, our social workers can absolutely handle that. I think if it gets into your will and estate planning, I uh, highly recommend seeking out legal support for that one. Okay, so this is a good clarifying question, Haley. Um, an uploaded document would suffice, um, but a copy of the document would not? Can so, you yeah. go back so over that bit? For the medical power of attorney and the living will, copies are 100% valid. You don't really have to have the original. It's just good to have an idea of where that is. Um, so that's why an uploaded copy is fine. Um, but if you have an out-of-hospital DNR, a copy of that is not I mean, you could have a copy, but you have to have a physical paper for that actually to be followed. So if you're going to the clinic, that's ambulatory. I suggest having a copy of that with you um, because they want to make sure that they're going to follow that if something does happen if you're in our facility. All right. So this is a, a question that we, we get uh, asked quite a bit of, if, the, if your spouse is always the best person um, to make decisions for you, if you're not able to make those yourself, 
Ellie, can you talk a little bit about maybe that conversation around uh, identifying your designee? Yeah. So I always say, if you have a spouse, let's start with that conversation. Um, t meet, have, have a moment to be like, hey, can we talk about the things that I want and do not want? Would you feel comfortable saying that maybe I don't want this to happen. Talking through your wishes and your desires with your partner, if it seems like maybe they're not going to be an emotional state to be able to make those good decisions if you're dying, then maybe we think about finding someone else to be your medical power attorney. Um, or you could have him as the first person and then you can have a second alternate. So if he's ha or if he's having like some issues where he's like, oh, I'm, I, ju I just can't make that decision, then they can move on to your alternates as well. That's why I always say just having alternates. Um, but even though someone might benefit from your death, I think I saw that from on one of the questions, that doesn't mean that they're not going to be a good medical power of attorney. Because oftentimes we're thinking about our family as people who are making those decisions for us. And that's typically where our assets would go if we died. Um, they just couldn't sign as a witness for any of your forms. Okay. Thank you. That's good info. That is the last question I see. And just a reminder that this recording will be emailed to you early next week. So you'll be able to review all of this um, and go back over some of the great content. And so with that being said, I think we are good for today. Um, so thank you so much again, everyone for joining us. Uh, wonderful, wonderful information, Haley. We appreciate you presenting this today. Uh, and we hope you will join us in future presentations. Um, we try to do this once a month, mid-month, or kind of third week of the month. So stay tuned for more of those. Thanks again, Haley. Thank you.